would like to do that. There will be lots of opportunities to ask questions as we go through. Um, I'm just going to set this up. My name is Terry Maxwell, and I am one of the founders of Shiftco. Um, and if you don't know much about us, we measure our success based on whether or not our members' businesses are growing. And um, as of um, August, 79% of our members had um, doubled or tripled their income um, using um, our methods and the things that we teach. But I'm always, I'm not so much interested in the 79, but I'm interested in the 21%. And so I started looking at what was different about the members that were having tremendous success and the ones that were not quite there. And what I found is it was really getting into the habit of having good habits. So um, one of the master teachers on our platform, he came highly recommended. Every one of his courses I have absolutely benefited from. And so I reached out to the maestro, the leadership expert, Tim Duffy, and said, Tim, can you talk to our members about how to master success habits and get yourself into a rhythm where you are focused on the things that you need to focus on that are going to move your life and your business forward. So Tim, take it away. I'm just delighted to learn from you today as I know our members will be. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate everyone who's participating in this training and I packed it full of information. So be prepared for the fire hose. Take as much notes as you can. And as Terry says, this will be recorded. So uh, let's start off with a little bit of a bio. If you're not familiar with who I am, again, my name is Tim Duffy. I've been doing uh, leadership and success training and coaching for over 17 years. And it started way back when I was in college. I was a very active student leader, became one of the youngest student government presidents to serve. I received uh, several leadership awards, not because I was so special, but because I had great mentors and they paved the pathway and I just followed their advice because I think success leaves clues. And after a college, I wanted to make a difference uh, in, in my community. So I worked in government for several years. But while I was doing that, I went back to my college, uh, Queens College City University of New York, and I love just training the future leaders. And so then I had an opportunity to work with the National National Society of Leadership and Success, which is now the largest collegiate leadership society. And I wore many hats in sales and account management, managed over 40 employees, over 600 uh, part-time sales reps slash interns. And I was also the broadcast producer. So uh, I got to meet some famous people and interview them about success and leadership. You might recognize some of those faces. And then after that, I said, you know what, I need a new challenge. Uh, so I decided to serve as a COO of two startup companies. And that was, whoa, a big learning experience for me. And so now I'm just, uh, my full-time gig is my Duffy Leadership Incorporated, where it's my training and coaching business. And I also created a, a nonprofit called Electus Society, which is geared towards helping college students become the next generation of leaders, focusing on training and develop uh, people in student government, clubs, and, and organizations, and other executive leaders. So that's just a little bit about me. So let's jump right in. So what are we going to talk about in this training? What are going to be the learning outcomes? You're going to be able to answer this question. What is the biggest challenge conscious entrepreneurs face? And then you're going to learn the most important questions to ask yourself whenever you're doing a task and how to say no. How many times is it difficult when a new opportunity, a request comes in from a colleague, an employee, a contractor, a friend, you know, a networking meeting? How you, you, you're thinking about it, it's an opportunity, you don't want to lose it, but how can you actually say no without disappointing others so you can stay focused on what you need to do? So I'm going to teach you that four-step process. And then I'm going to talk about three successful management tips so that you can get more done because... God knows I know how much your to-do lists are, and it probably keeps adding and growing. And because this is a training that's already in the core, I'm going to be covering concepts from module one and module three. But what I'm not covering here, which unfortunately, just because of the sake of the time, is module number two. And in module two is a life changing exercise all about this topic that we're going to be talking about. So write it down, put it in your calendar as an agenda goal, go back and watch 
module number two and complete this exercise. Uh, it, it will transform your effectiveness. And then we're going to be talking about the habits of the most successful entrepreneurs. And because my passion is leadership, we'll end it a little bit about what is the most important leadership quality and how to instantly gain gain credibility when you screw up because god knows i've screwed up many times and and learned from it so i know that you you probably have as well and may do so in the future just like i imagine i will so let's jump right in in the chat why don't you share what do you think is the biggest challenge conscious entrepreneurs face well, when I've talked with different entrepreneurs, they might say something like sales, they might say something like, you know, implementing their vision, but I'm curious to sh hear what you guys have to share on what you think is the biggest challenge. And then I'm going to share with you what I actually believe that it is. Was there anybody who'd like to share or post it in the chat what they think that is? I'll give a moment. Lisa, Kristen, Jeanette. Any comments, thoughts? Managing our time. Yes, balancing between securing work and administration. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Jeanette. Well, Kristen, you get the golden ticket for uh, the, the feedback. Yes, getting in front of enough people. As you can actually see, all of these kind of interact with each other. But I would say, as you can show, uh, this is an image from my favorite Broadway play, Hamilton. What I believe is the biggest challenge based on working with different people, as Kristen had mentioned, is time. And as the play says, you could have done so much more, Hamilton, if you only had more time. And the reason is because if you had more time, Jeanette, you could be able to balance securing work with administrative work. Or uh, Lisa, you would be have enough time to actually get in front of the enough people that you need. So again, I'm already assuming that you have done a great job in order to get to where you are in terms of managing your time, right? Uh, it started with me and my experience when I went to uh, high school, I'm like, oh my goodness, there's so much more work than uh, you know junior high. And then when I got to college, I'm like, oh my goodness, there's so much work than when I went to high school. And then after I graduated and I'm in the workforce, I'm like, oh my goodness. So you just find ways and ways to just kind of manage and do what you need to do. But I would like this training to be either a refresher or help you take you to that next, next level. Again, maybe some of you have heard some of these concepts, but some of you may not be actually implementing them. So let's make this training session, the one that is uh, going to transform you into taking action. So the best place I'd start off is with a CEO that I work with. And I'll, I'll just say that his name is John. And so I was working with John. He hired me as his coach, his executive coach, to help him transform and scale his company, his startup, so that it could get to astronomical success. And so as you can tell, you know, after a coaching session, we ended with what your action steps are going to be. And one of those action steps was, hey, why don't you have a website, right, for your company? You need to create a frequently asked questions for your product or services. So why don't you create that? And he said, yes, I'll do it. Okay, great. So guess what happens? The next week I connect with him. So how did it go with the FAQs? Oh, Tim, you don't understand. I got this uh, agenda item on my plate. A family member needed me here. And then, oh my goodness, I had this contractor or partner reach me about this opportunity, which was urgent. So I, again, I didn't have time to actually do this activity. I said, okay, got it. So what can you put in place to make sure that you, you know, make sure that gets done? Oh yes, definitely. I'll make sure that I do it. Guess what happens the next week, right? nothing happens. All right, come on. What do we got to do? We got to make this happen. We're not going to move forward unless we do it. And so as you can tell, the pressure is starting to build. I'm holding him accountable. And by the third time, I'm like, you got to work on this FAQ of this website. So I check in with him and guess what he did? He's like, Tim, you're going to be very proud of me. I worked on the FAQ. Not only did I work on the FAQ, I spent all night working on it. I'm like, all night? Why are you working all night? He says, because our, we're, our website is in WordPress. And so it, it was actually all wonky. And I had to learn WordPress in order to make adjustments. And I'm like, well, did you actually do the FAQs? He's like, no, I started putting the FAQs. But then guess what? I recognized as I started rereading them, I needed to change some of them. And so guess what? I, I fixed some of the questions, but a lot of the other questions that I needed to to still do. So it's not completely done, but I made great progress on it. And I said, John, 
how much time did you spend working on this FAQs and this WordPress of the site? He's like, well, I pulled an all-nighter. I spent about 15 hours. I said, 15 hours? Are you serious? I said, oh my gosh. All right, John, listen to me for a second. Right now, you actually can quantify and value your time. You're the founder of this, uh, you know, of this startup. You're the CEO. How much do you think your time is worth? All right, let's just do it for simple math. Maybe your time is worth $100 an hour, maybe $200 an hour. Okay, so $100 an hour. You spent 15 hours on an FAQ for a website, and it's not even done, okay? That's $1,500. And I said, that is not smart. <laughs> you could actually build out, write down all the FAQs, hire somebody on Fiverr, you know, have them post up the website. And guess what? I did that myself. I created a website. It took me about five hours. I used GoDaddy, used the template and everything like that. And guess what? Boop, I, I submitted it up. He said, but what about all the changes I needed to make? I had to make it perfect. It, it, was, it was not the right language. And I said, listen, this is something that I had to learn working with different successful uh, CEOs is that there's a, a, a kind of bug inside of them that everything has to be perfect. But guess what happens? Perfection is the enemy of the good. You can spend so many times being perfect, being perfect, being perfect, while somebody else puts something on the website and is not perfect and is going to get further than you are right? And here's what uh, I shared with him. I didn't want you to think that I don't care about excellence. I definitely do. But guess what's going to happen? If you could just hire that person or do that or put that up on that, that website, just get it up there. Guess what's going to happen? The next time, a week from now, two weeks from now, you're going to look at your website and you're going to say, oh my goodness, I need to make some edits. And then you'll make those edits in real time. Or guess what's going to happen? Like other uh, CEOs that I know, all this work that you put in there, guess what? Within one or two months, it's going to completely change. You're going to get a brand new website. So again, the whole purpose of this story is, you know, you could have spent those 15 hours doing sales calls that could have actually been bringing revenue in. So really has to do with your time management and what you're focusing on. So I basically have encountered a lot of successful entrepreneurs and unsuccessful entrepreneurs. And one of the things that they like to claim themselves to be is workaholic martyrs. Okay. What is a workaholic martyr? It's a person who interacts with everybody and likes to share with them how busy they are. <laughs> I don't know if any of you fall into that category, but I used to do that myself. Oh, I'm so busy, I'm so busy, I'm so busy. And guess what that does? It makes you have an excuse to not follow up with people, to not get back to them. You get to wear this as almost like a shield or pride of look how busy I am. And guess what? It's not productive. You're not effective. And you end up burning the candlestick at both ends. You know, uh, there's a famous management line that says, if you want the job done, get, give it to a busy person, right? Because they know how to prioritize. They know how to get things done. When I, you know, I, as I shared with you before, I manage over 40 employees, over 600 sales reps. And listen, we were able to break sales records, but time after time, whether it was part-time intern sales reps or whether it was full-time employees, I'm telling you, this issue of time management kept popping up in my face. And I would work with people like you're going to do in this training, as well as if you do module two and do this exercise, that's going to really transform your life. I've had C players become A players and get promotions because they implemented these tips that I'm about to give you. So again, I'm assuming that maybe some of you have heard of all the different You've heard the word prioritization. I've heard it. How many times? I even heard it in college. Don't forget to prioritize. But it's easier said than done. I remember reading Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and it talked about creating a grid of what is important, not important, but what's urgent and not urgent, and you have to focus on these kind of things. If you've ever read the book, you know what I'm talking about. Again, 
I think that's a useful tool. Other companies, organizations may have their own prioritization tools. I like this one, all right? You just need to ask yourself whatever is on your to-do list, because I know that each one of you has amazing ideas. I know that you have a vision of, I could do this, I can do this. Just start writing them all down. Have a spreadsheet. <laughs> I, I knew my, my former CEO would have uh, a list of ideas that was over 200 long, uh, 200 uh, you know, rows long. But guess what happened? He had a good manager and guided him and used this prioritization method. Ask yourself every question uh, in time you're doing this task. Is this in alignment with my goals and what kind of level of priority it is? Is it an immediate business need is it a significant business enhancement or is it nice to have? And you have to really just filter it out based on all those three categories. And I'm going to give you an example. So let's just say, for example, this the CEO I was working with was John. And John would say, oh, my goodness, Tim, we, I, I, I need help. We need to actually update our sales flyer for this product or service or solution. You know, we need to make it uh, updated. So we're going to use this as a tool to actually sell more, right, of our products and services. And so he felt that this was the most important thing that he would need to do. All right, I'd go along with him. All right, let me help you do that. Let's do that. He would update it, right? And then suddenly he would want to work on something else. Oh, I, we have this other product or service. Why don't we work on that? We need to create a new sales flyer that I'm like, Whoa, 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 whoa. We just spent all this time working on this one sales flyer. And now you already want to jump. Down. We haven't even sold anything with this one yet. Why are we jumping into this one? So again, what I'm trying to share with you, this is a pattern, right? A lot of, uh, and, it, and I, I'm going to talk about at the end, some of the other trainings that I've done with Shifco, which is high performance communication, knowing your personality type, this CEO and entrepreneur that I'm talking about fits a certain uh, archetype of a different personality, right? Always seeing the opportunity, easily excited and motivated by other things. So I said, listen, you have to basically prioritize everything into these three categories. Okay, is updating a sales flyer an immediate business need, significant business enhancement, or nice to have? An immediate business need, I explained to him, is something that puts directly money into your pocket. It's the bottom line revenue of your company, your organization, or it's something that you promised to deliver for your customers. For example, uh, if the website is down, it's an expectation that the website needs to be up in order to service your customers or be able to be up. So that would be suddenly an immediate business need. A significant business enhancement will actually you know, make a big difference. So if you didn't have a, a sales flyer, then yes, maybe that might be a significant business enhancement that you need to do or need to accomplish, right? But how have you been making sales calls before? Have you been picking up the phone? Maybe it's not as necessary to have a sales flyer, or maybe you already have one, but a significant business enhancement might be, well, now let's make a, a video, right? That will actually significantly get more people, instead of reading everything about what we do, they'll have a short one to three minute video to learn about our service. Okay, that might be a significant business enhancement. And then the last thing is a nice to have is it's nice. And unfortunately, a lot of conscious entrepreneurs are very passionate about different things and they want to focus on these level three priorities, these nice to haves. And so if you could just ask yourself, does updating that sales flyer, is that a nice to have? Like you can't stand it. It's so long. You got all this feedback from, from your customers saying this needs to change. This is not accurate. But guess what? Is it really going to make a big difference? Is it going to move the needle? in terms of your revenue, your company, what you got going on. Chances are updating a sales flyer, you can actually still use it and it'll just be fine. So again, I hope that's very helpful. And let's just jump in to the next topic. So the next topic is how to say no. Now, if you're like me, I'm a recovering people pleaser. So I don't know if any of you in the audience are, are, are like that, that whenever somebody tries to make a request of me, I feel bad. You know, it's just to say no. It's almost like a form of rejection. But it wasn't until I learned in my studies how to actually say no. And so there was a four-step process. And I'm going to tell you what it is right here. The first time 
someone says or makes a request from you and they say, hey, Tim, and I'm going to use a very simple example to illustrate this point, but you can extrapolate it to a much more complex example with, with whatever, whether it's a business opportunity or whatever. I would just say, hey, a friend wants to ask me to go out to the movies, right? Hey, uh, Tim, can you uh, come to the movies with me? We want to go see the latest Top Gun movie, whatever it might be. What am I going to say? First of all, I want to say thank you so much for asking me to go see the movie with you. I actually, uh, you know, I've been eager to see that. I'd like to see that. But then here's step two, give an affirmative no. I definitely cannot see the movie with you this weekend. <laughs> but what do other people do? They usually say, I don't think I can go. I probably can't. You see all those kind of wishy-washy, trying to not be harsh or mean kind of words ends up actually telling the other person, convince me, tell me, you know, try to convince me to say yes. Cause that's what my friend would do would say, come on, Tim, what do you got going on? It's just two hours. And then it would continue to proceed. But then number three, we, you would need to give them a reason why the reason why I can't go to the movies with you is because of X, Y, Z. Right. And then lastly, most people would end it there. Right. And then kind of leave, feel bad, you know, but I would say, give them some kind of support help them with their request, give them an idea or suggestion. You know, it might be, hey, have you checked with your Rachel or Lowell or Cynthia, whether they would want to go to the movies with you? I think they would be eager to see it. No, I haven't actually asked them yet. Okay, well, why don't you just check with them? But good luck. I hope you really enjoy the movie. So that takes the sting out of it. Now, when it comes to you as a conscious entrepreneur, hey, I have an opportunity for you to either be part of this company, do this. Guess what? Follow the four-stand process. Thank you so much for the request. It means so much to me that you've asked me or thought of me for this opportunity, but I definitely cannot take advantage of this opportunity. And the reason why is I need to stay focused on my priorities, which is my business, my enterprise, or this product or solution. And I can't be distracted or focus on anything else right now because I have to achieve or hit my goals. But you know what? I wish you the best of luck. Here's a contact information of another individual that I think would be great for you. I would actually research this company. I think these are the type of customers that you might want, well, but good luck with you, good sir. All right, great. Have a great day. And they're going to walk away saying, that person, you know what? They're very helpful. And that's all you really wanted to do the uh, first time. So again, master this skill and say no affirmatively, and <laughs> you'll be uh, achieving so much more. And so I'll just want to share with you one more analogy before I leave this, because I think it's so important. You know, using this case example of John and how, you know, he was easily distracted and wanted to do all these things. The analogy would be, again, I'm a, I'm a big nature lover. So, you know, don't, don't be upset with me that I'm using this analogy, but imagine you're cutting down a tree, okay? And you need it for firewood or whatever it would be. What many conscious entrepreneurs, they say, I need firewood. So they start chopping down the tree, but then they see another tree. Oh, let me start chopping that one down. Let me start chopping that one down. And guess what? You've started chopping so many different trees that the trees haven't completely fall down for you to make wood yet. So how much more effective would you have been if you said no to all those other trees and just focused on one tree? Boom, 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 then go to the next one. It's <laughs> nice, Kristen. I love it. I'm a tree chopper. Great, great. Uh, that's what we love to hear. So become a metaphorical tree chopper. Uh, all right. So here are three management tips that I'm going to give you. And this is what's really helpful for me in terms of mastering your time. Anytime you do a task, always assume double. Hey, in your mind, you say, I need to write that email. How long would that email take me? 15 minutes? Well, guess what? I want you to, uh, you know, to pretend that that email is actually 30 minutes. So what does that mean? If somebody says, hey, Tim, can you do this? Oh, I just have to write this email. I wouldn't say, oh, I'll get back to you in 15 minutes. I would say, I'll get you back to you in 30 minutes. I need to send out this email. Why? Is because things always take a lot longer than you actually think that they are going to take. Now, it may take 15 minutes if you were uninterrupted, had no distractions, but we're living in the world of distractions, right? You, your phone rings, your husband or wife calls you, uh, your kids may need you, um, you know, this person. 
again, all these different things. Oh, maybe you're typing the email. Oh, wait a minute. I don't know about this. I have to Google search that. So you didn't anticipate that you needed research before you could answer that email. So again, this is a cycle. And so that's what you, you assume double. If you think that this job is going to take you, you know, six hours, yes, assume that it takes 12 hours because you've already planned buffer time to make sure that it happens. So the second principle of time management is live by the calendar, you die by the calendar. Now that same may seem extreme. Whenever I, I talk about this with people, they say, yeah, but Tim, aren't you just living your life all by the calendar and you have no freedom? No, it's actually the opposite. Once I embrace this, that I live by the calendar and I die by the calendar, I tell my wife, I tell my friends, if it's not on my calendar, it doesn't exist. And so uh, when I first did this training back in February 11, 2021, I actually did an actual screenshot of my calendar. This is what it looked like. Now, uh, again, I have, I have five animals, three cats, two dogs. I got to wake up in the morning, feed them, and then I work out. I have to take the garbage out on Thursdays. Well, guess what? Notice how I actually accounted for 30 minutes for garbage. Tim, does it really take you 30 minutes of garbage? No, it's because I'm operating from the principles that I'm teaching to you and everyone listening that it takes me less than 15 minutes, but I assume double. Because guess what happens? I go to let out the garbage and then I realize, oh, I have to do the cans and the recycling or, oh, what if the raccoons knock that up? I didn't anticipate that I had to clean up all the, the bottles that are on the floor. So as you can tell, things start to add up. So you plan that buffer. Uh, and then as you can see here, all my schedule, I still have some areas of blank that could be filled in, but this is how I live my life. This is where my focus is. And it just, you know, with this discipline, you're going to get so much freedom. Now, some people say, well, Tim, should I use uh, the Google Calendar? Should I use a handwritten calendar? It doesn't matter. You know, I think that you, as long as you choose one method and you stick to it, it can be transformational. I think that there is an advantage if you can fall in love with Google Calendar, like I have, that it's so much easier when you actually go to the doctor's appointment and they say, let's book an appointment. I pull up my phone, since we all have our phone, to put it in the calendar, put it in right there. That way, it's more instantaneous. I don't know if you're going to carry around your agenda book everywhere you go. And wh what happens if you lose it? Again, I like the idea of efficiency, going things to the cloud. So if, if you can end up adopting that, even if it's uncomfortable for you, my recommendation is to do so. And then the last thing, and I, it, this has to deal with human nature. People are not responsive. <laughs> People do not follow through with what they say they're going to do. Uh, you know, I, I learned this concept doing sales, working with all these different companies and different organizations and schools and things like that, administrators, is that anytime you need something, you can't just anticipate that it's going to be accomplished. You actually have to anticipate that people are distracted, lack focus, that they're not as disciplined with you with, with request your time. And so therefore you would just have to build in constant reminders. And I learned this as a manager where uh, I remember some managers getting so uh, upset with their employees to say, you know what? I told you once, I told you, I don't have to repeat myself. And I said, you know what? That's coming from ego. All right. Employees are being asked to do so much, so much responsibility, more in less time. As a good manager, I would say, no, I would basically say it verbally. Then I would send it out in a written format to remind them. And guess what? If I'm putting the deadline in my calendar, uh, I would actually include that deadline as an all-day event in my employee's calendar or my contract calendar. And I remember one of my other colleagues say, you know what, Tim, aren't you babying your contractors or aren't you babying your employees? Shouldn't they be responsible enough to do that? And I'm like, listen, no, I'm as a manager, I want to be effective and I want to anticipate uh, you know, uh, uh, what's going to happen and put in systems in place so it doesn't happen. So if I come to the situation where an employee is saying, oh, Tim, I didn't complete that, they can't say, oh, I forgot it and no. Well, I said it, I emailed it, it was on the calendar. There's no confusion. And so guess what I have? Peace of mind. My team were the, some of the highest performers in the company. And so that is because I already assumed that anytime I had a deadline or anything like that, I assume that I needed to send out reminders and do what I need to do, especially if it was very complicated. So I hope that tip uh, is, is very helpful for you. So now 
let's move into habits, okay? Uh, there's this famous line, uh, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, therefore, is not an act, but it's a habit. And it's quoted by Aristotle. So a book that really transformed my life was uh, Tim Ferriss. Uh, he wrote the book Tools for Titans. He also wrote, wrote the book Four Hour Work Week, which is like, you know, I would say the entrepreneur's manifesto, <laughs> which is very helpful. But in this book, <clears throat> He, he interviewed the most successful entrepreneurs, right? The billionaires, the world-class performers, right? Some of the most successful people in the world. And what did he find was the pattern for success? What were the habits that they did to accomplish so much? And so while there are so many that he shared, I'm going to share with you the three that I found most important, okay? Number one was a gratitude journal. Now, a gratitude journal, who actually has time to actually journal every day and write down what they're thinking, what they're feeling? That blew me away, right? To see all these successful people do this. And what he actually developed is something called the five-minute gratitude journal. Now we're talking, all right? As a busy person, I can do that, maybe five minutes. And here's a picture of the gratitude journal. And just if you think that I'm just talking, Here's my copy right here. I already buy it on Amazon and I buy like five or six copies and then I use them up and I, I just do it every day. It's, it's now incorporated as part of my habit. Why? Because the research has shown as this study, people who do a gratitude journal have better sleep. When you have better sleep, what does that mean? You're more productive, more alert, better ideas, reduction in physical you know, pains, ailments, right? Greater well-being. It just, you're operating at a, such a higher level of performance. I recently uh, saw a study, Deepak Chopra created a foundation to, start, uh, to study about mindfulness and meditation. And he took a group of about over 186 patients with health problems, and they decided to do a gratitude journal for a period of eight weeks. And guess what happened? All the different markers that show at risk for cardiac arrest were significantly reduced. There is something very powerful about ha having the attitude of gratitude and doing this journal activity, even if it's for five minutes in the day, to help you. Now, again, you don't even have to spend money. I'm going to show you what are the five questions in a gratitude journal that right now you can buy a college ruled $1 notebook or $2 notebook or some piece of paper and you can start doing it right now. So there is no excuse on why you can't be doing this, right? Uh, the second was exercise, right? Doing physical activity. It, they say that doing exercise is the equivalent of taking one antidepressant, right? Just because it's for your whole well-being to be physically fit, physically strong, challenge your body, doing strength training, all that other stuff. And again, I use this image of a person in a wheelchair because look, there's no excuse. Now, some people might say, as I've encountered like, Tim, you don't understand. I work full time. I'm doing this side business. I, I'm, I'm being a conscious entrepreneur with Shipco. I have all these classes. I'm trying to build this up. Uh, I have my kids and responsibilities and my families. Where, oh, where am I going to find the time to actually exercise? And I'm going to share with you something that I learned from Tim Ferriss and a lot of other productivity experts. What people do is they turn an anthill, you know, that little mound, and they turn it into Mount Everest, right? They take a problem and they make it so big. So in your mind, you may have heard the studies do three to uh, 60 minutes of cardio four to five times a week to have a health, healthy, balanced diet. Listen, I think that as we go back to the beginning of this presentation, perfection is the enemy of the good. I have more respect for somebody who says, Tim, I work so much all throughout the day. I actually, in the morning, I only dedicate five minutes to working out. And what I do is I do 10 jumping jacks and, you know, I do a couple of squats and that's all I got. And that's all I have time for. I'd say, bravo, you're ahead of the game because you're not going to let, uh, you know, some kind of ideal image of perfection limit your success. You start off with something small. And you make the, the, the action step so easy to do that the moment that you start doing it, guess what? You're like, okay, 
after this presentation, listening to Tim, I'm just going to do, you know, uh, 10 push-ups, 10 jumping jacks and 10 squats or five jumping jacks, five squats, whatever it can be within your physical uh, range or, or limits, right? Don't hurt yourself, right? But what, guess what's going to happen? You're going to do those squats and then suddenly you're going to like, ooh, that kind of felt good. Or, oh, I feel like I'm energized. You know what? I can maybe do a five little more. And so you end up doing a little bit more. So what you started out only as a commitment for one minute to five minutes ends up becoming a 10 minute exercise. And then you're actually very proud of yourself. And if you follow the principles of what you learned earlier, you've built the buffer. So if you said that I was going to do five minutes of exercise, you put it in your calendar 10 minutes and guess what? You're good to go. Okay. And then the last point is meditation. And I'm already assuming that a lot of you in this conscious community of conscious entrepreneurs uh, are a big proponents of meditation, incorporate meditation into your life. But let's go back to this example that we've been talking about. Are you trying to put an ideal on your meditation, you're like, oh my goodness, I'm supposed to meditate for 30 minutes a day uh, in the morning or at night, and then you're not able to do it, and then kicking yourself in the butt, I wish I did, had 30 minutes. Well, guess what? Just like we did with exercise, just like the five-minute journal, there's no reason why you can't do five minutes of meditation. And if you're saying, Tim, you don't know me, you don't know my schedule. I said, there's no reason why you can't do one minute of meditation. And that means simply closing your eyes, taking deep breaths in and out, imagining white light hit your forehead and your heart, and you're done. Okay. Guess what's going to happen? You do that for one minute, you're already going to feel a transformation. You're already tapping into the universal consciousness. You're already going to find out that you have better ideas. You're going to be more focused. It's, you know, uh, I like to say that, that, you know, we need to take baths and wash ourselves in order to stay clean every day. Well, guess what? You need to meditate every day so you can actually bathe your brain, you know, with all the negative thoughts and all the outside stimuli, all the news, like you need to be able to connect to that higher source so that you can start off the day right. So that's what my challenge to all of you is do five minutes, <laughs> breathe your brain. <laughs> Thanks, Terry. Uh, you know, five minutes of gratitude journal, five minutes of exercise, five minutes of meditation. You got 15 minutes. And if you tell me you can't, then promise me this, you'll do at least one minute of each. And so what I wanted to share with you right now is what are these five uh, questions that uh, are in the gratitude journals? Now, Every journal is different. Um, the one that I have has basically, here are three questions to ask you in the morning. And then here are two questions that you uh, have to ask yourself at night. And I've read a lot of the literature the, of the different you know, speakers, experts on success. They do recommend having a gratitude journal to do this, an entry in the morning and the night. But I don't believe in sharing something with you that I don't implement myself. So for me, what works it, for me in my life, I just made the commitment to do it every morning, not every night. I do, before I go to bed, I do a, a little meditation, which I do think does help me, but here are the five questions, and I actually crossed them out, and I rewrote the questions so that it applied to just do it every morning. So take a moment to feel free to write these down. Okay, the first question is, reflect. What were your amazing moments yesterday? Oh, okay, all right. I, I took a wonderful walk with my wife. Uh, I, I did a presentation with Shifco. You know, all these different things, and and you start thinking about it. You're like, oh my god, look how beautiful things that I accomplished that that day. And oh, I forgot what happened in the morning. You're already starting to vibrate at a different frequency, right? The second thing is. How can I improve or make tomorrow better? Now, again, they would always ask this question is like, what could you have done differently today? I don't like that judgmental question of, of as if something that you did today that you did was wrong. No, everything happened exactly the way that it needed to happen, but you could always work on what would you like to improve or, 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 you know, or do better the next day. That to me is a very positive uh, way to look at it. The next thing is gratitude. What are you grateful for, right? All the different things. And then the fourth is your to-do list. 
right? Now, how I do my to-do list is I basically think about all the different categories of my life. I might think about my personal life, what I need to do to just personally, what I may need to do with my job or career. I need to focus that. And you can have other multiple ones as well for all the different categories in your life, but at least personal and, and, and work are, are the most simple categories. And what then I do is I think about all the things that I do and I list them all out. And guess what happens? If you're like me, that list is really, really long and it starts adding, adding up. But here's the secret. Remember, this whole training is all about focus, right? If you could only accomplish one of those things, which one would it be? And of all the priorities, which is the immediate business need, not the significant business enhancement, not the nice to have, even though that's something that you may want to do more than the other, that's what you do. And so what I want you to do is put a star by it, you circle it, you put it in your calendar, and now you've put it into existence. And you do that first thing in the morning before you answer emails, before you check your social media, before you do all of that stuff. And guess what? you're going to be more productive than 90% of the people out in the world. Again, I'm making that statistic up, but that's based on my own anecdotal experience. I've learned these habits. And when I was working for the National Society of Leadership and Success, I always held two positions in the company at the same time. And that when I retired from that position and that I would move on to something else, do you know what would happen? The person that came in would say, whoa, this is way too much work for me. And they would end up splitting the role into different. So they would have to hire two people to do the one thing that I was doing. Why am I saying that? Not to boast. It's just because I don't get distracted with anything that's not my primary focus. I'm not on social media in terms I'm not on Facebook. I have accounts, but I'm not checking Instagram. I'm not checking Facebook. I'm not doing all these other things. Why? It's because I made a choice on what I want to focus with my time. And the moment I focus, going back to that tree example, I'm an expert at log cutting when it comes to providing firewood and providing firewood for my family, right? Because I've made that commitment. So my invitation for you is to do the same. And then the last thing is a positive affirmation. And so where, where that comes is, you know, they say that the most two important words in the English language is I am. OK, now, whatever your spiritual beliefs, you know, we all know that I am is very powerful words. Exodus 314, you know, what is the name of God? I am that I am. We have been given this life. We've been given this power to actually do all these things. How are you going to use this energy time uh, and, and this 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 flow that's coming towards you, this creativity? Now, if you say, I am sick, I am sick, I am sick. Well, guess what? you're going to start to feel sick because that's what you're focusing on. That's what you're creating with the words I am. So use this creative force to create something positive, something constructive. And so I'll tell you what my affirmations are. I say, I am a child of the light. I serve the light. You know, I love the light. I'm illuminated by the light. I'm guided by the light. And I have a whole bunch of other affirmations. And guess what? It changes my physiology. It changes the way I interact throughout the day. I feel bathed in it. I am abundance. And then I suddenly, every time I declare that in the morning, you know, even though I look around, I could say, well, hey, well, I don't have this. I don't have this. But I'm like, but abundance is everywhere. You know, it's just there. I, oh, I'm so grateful. Oh, I just got a check in here for $700 that I didn't anticipate. Thank you, abundance. You see, so once you start declaring these affirmations, as you all know, guess what happens? You're calling upon the universe to help focus and manifest that, right? And it doesn't mean that it's just all wishy-washy, right? It's like, oh, it's not like the, the secret and where you just wish it and then it appears. It's no, it's embodying and being that. And so that once you accept that, then you go out throughout your day and you start taking action consistent with that. So again, very, very powerful stuff. Don't start your day without it. So I'm going to give you a, a fourth bonus, right? Because uh, I said those were the three habits, uh, you know, but do a fourth one. Oh, absolutely, Jeanette. I love it. Be, do, and have. I, I think that's great. Um, the, the thing is that not all readers are leaders, but all leaders are are readers. Uh, Harry S. Truman, the 33rd president. So I believe that all these people that you would talk to, if you ask them, do you read books? People would say, I don't have the time. 
But guess what? How many times do they exercise or, and they could be listening to an audiobook? Or guess what? Just going back to the examples that we shared before is that, you know, if you could have five minutes for um, gratitude journal, five minutes for exercise, five minutes for, um, you know, meditation, what if you could actually have five minutes for just reading? Now, what can you read? Again, I recommend positive books, spiritual books that enlighten you. Um, I could talk about books that are biographies about amazing people that you admire, or just even it could be fictional books, but there's some kind of hero's journey of somebody standing up to their fears over accomplishing what they were scared, uh, afraid to do. It might inspire you to challenge your fears and, and go out and do something. I don't mind, but you if you do a page a day, that could be read in a, in a minute or two. And just imagine over a period of time, if you just commit to that one page or whatever it may be, you're you're going to read more books than the average person. Okay. And then the next is reading books on success and leadership, which is my passion. Again, I highly recommend seven habits of highly effective people. It is like the PhD of leadership. And every page that I read, whenever I reread it, I learn more every time. And, and it's just so dense. Uh, it's like, a, it's so powerful, but uh, it has so much wisdom. So it, it's worth reading over and over again. So Let's, uh, you know, we'll conclude this presentation about leadership. So what do you think is the most important leadership quality? Okay, there's a bunch of them on there. I'd love to hear it from all of you. So Janet, you know, Terry, who else? Who would like to share what they think is the most important leadership quality? Let's see what we have as some responses, right? As you can see, there's the ones that say appreciation, humility, responsibility, communication is really big, purpose, uh, passion, right? Well, uh, I'm going to tell you what I believe is the most important one. Okay, Kristen says commitment, continually improving yourself. I love it. I think that's uh, that's something that I value and I do every day, right? Especially with this presentation is set here and see how you can improve it tomorrow, right? <laughs> I love that. So I'm going to share with you what I learned is the most important leadership quality that you all can adopt as conscious entrepreneurs. And it's going to actually transform your business. And here's what it is. It's integrity. Now, when I first learned about integrity, I, I learned about it in college. And they would say, well, integrity is about having warm principles, being honest. I think that's what most people think integrity means. But what I discovered is there's an actual second definition to integrity, and that is complete completeness. It's the quality of being whole, sound, and complete, the quality of being undivided and unimpaired. And so I love this cartoon where it, you see on the stand, it says, voters demand integrity from their election system. That means if I vote, that it's going to be counted and everything like that. But then the person uh, says on the right, who knows, maybe someday we'll demand it it from the people we put in office. How many times do politicians say that this is what they're going to do and then they end up not doing it? Okay, this is, means being integrous with the words, with the promises that we keep. And I discovered that this was the most uh, important leadership principle by attending a uh, landmark education. If you're not familiar with landmark, I'll give them a little plug because I'm so grateful for the transformational education that they gave me. There's a three day conference. It's a, a little less than $700 and they teach you about integrity and all these other different things, uh, you know, beyond just integrity. But I was able to transform my relationship with my wife. Why? Because of integrity. I basically discovered how I was not in integrity with our, my relationship. I cleaned it up. I apologized to my wife, showed where I was out of integrity, made a commitment to improve. And guess what? We were able to survive our relationship and it was on the brink of divorce. And so it was amazing. I love their program. I'm like, I need more of this. I did their advanced program. And then I did their four month advanced executive self-expression and leadership program. And woo, I was hooked, right? 
uh, because again, you know me, I'm really passionate about leadership, any kind of tools that I can learn that I love to be able to share and educate everybody. Again, I'm giving them a plug, highly recommend them. But in that four month leadership course, and again, all this material is based on the great work of Werner Erhard. And you can go on YouTube and you can hear his different speeches and things like that. It's just a lot of just practical wisdom. But they said that integrity has different levels to it. And they taught me that integrity is doing what you know to do, doing what you said you would do, doing a job completely, doing job as it was expected to be done, and doing it as it was meant to be done and doing it on time. I was like, whoa, that's a whole nother level of integrity. Can you imagine if you worked with your partner and you started doing what they expected of you and did a job completely and they didn't even ask you to do it? Like, whoa, mind blown, right? And once you actually adopt this, you start to recognize where it shows up in over your life. And so to me, it was difficult to remember all these different levels. So I just created my own acronym to remember it all. And it was KSM plus T, right? Like, Casey Kasem, the famous radio disc jockey. And so whenever I said, okay, what are all the different levels of integrity? Kasem, NT. K, okay, knowing what to do. S, said you would do. C, complete. Uh, e, expected. M, meant to be done and doing it on time. And so I'm going to give you a perfect example. I hate doing dishes. <laughs> this is my responsibility that I've divided up with my partner, my wife. And she's like, Tim, you do the dishes. And I'm like, okay. So we have a dishwasher and I'll wash the dishes. I'll rinse them off and then put them in the dishwasher. And guess what happens? The dishwasher would get really full because the dishes will pile up. And then in my head, I said, well, dishwasher's full. That's all I could do. And then I would leave dishes in the sink. Right. And then again, my wife would come to me. Hey, there's uh, dishes in the sink. What's going on? I'm like, Dishwasher was full, couldn't fill up anymore. It's like, you can't wash them by hand or something like that, you know? And then I started to realize, wow, I'm really out of integrity because I find excuses of why I don't want to do it. You know, I, I said, oh yeah, dishwasher's full and I'm not doing the job completely. I'm not doing the job as it was expected to be done, as it was meant to be done. She expects a clean kitchen with no dishes and I'm not doing that. And uh, I mean, I don't mind beating up on myself, you know, uh, about chores and things like that. Some of you may be actually recognize this with your partners, your husbands or whatever it may be. But even it comes to, uh, you know, building up a bookshelf from Ikea, I would say, my job is to complete, uh, build the bookshelf. I do it. Guess what? I leave a mess everywhere. The boxes. Guess what? It's expected. It's meant to be done that when you do this job, you have to clean up after you. So how does this silly example apply to you on your business is how many times are you working with partners, with customers, with these individuals where they didn't ask you, or you didn't give a deadline on when you would deliver this product, service, or solution, but guess what? It was expected. It was meant to be done. And so maybe you yourself are cutting corners on trying to do what you said you were going to do, or maybe you find some excuses, or you do the task, but you don't do it on time. So if you uh, can do this, you're going to transform because uh, the famous line goes that you can take your whole life to build a reputation and it takes one second for you to destroy that reputation. Meaning how you are known by your peers, by your customers, by your colleagues, your employees is how you keep your word, right? You don't make promises that you can't keep. And so uh, what happens when you do make promises and you can't keep? Well, here's a simple way. This is the get out of jail free card, but you have to do both of the steps. You apologize for the broken promise. And what you will do is you make a commitment that you will put something in place in the future so that it never happens again. Okay. And so I have worked with so many people who make promises and can't complete it. And then every time they say, Tim, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. It's like, it almost feels like numb to me at this point, because, you know, people are always apologizing for not following through with what they said that they were going to do, that it, it, it just, it's, you get tired of it, right? But what really impresses with me, what me is when people actually say, you know what, Tim, I said I was going to be here at nine. 
It's now 9.05. You know what? What I'm going to do is what I'm going to put in place is I'm going to leave my house even earlier and anticipate that there's going to be traffic so that I'm making sure that I'm going to be on time. And if they do that and they tell me what they're putting in place as a system to prevent it from happening, I'm like, okay, I don't need to coach you. I don't need to manage you yourself or <laughs> you coaching yourself, you know, you're self-regulating. You're my favorite person to work with. And how many times everybody who doesn't keep their word usually most often has to do with these three things. They they made a promise that they couldn't keep. They didn't put it in their calendar. They didn't assume double. And they didn't have, plan a buffer, right? And they didn't set alarms for themselves because guess what? We all get focused and we get easily distracted. So when I wake up every morning, this is my habit that I do. I say, what's my calendar? Okay. All right. I said this meeting, this meeting here. I tell S-I-R-I, I'm just not saying it right now, we don't want to wake up the beast, uh, you know, artificial intelligence, but I say, set an alarm for this time, five minutes before, and then I, I do my call, whatever it may be. So I'm always on time. And then the moment I actually said, you know what? I set my five o'clock alarm, but I was still late. Why was I late? Oh, I was late because I was taking a nap and then when I was taking my nap, my, you know, my five minute alarm went off and I wanted to go get ready. So I now know in the future, if I have a meeting and I'm taking a nap or something like that, I have to set the alarm 15 minutes ahead. So again, you, you create these rules for yourself. You put these systems in place so that you can keep your word. And I'm telling you, people will want to work with you because again, if you are not a person of integrity, nobody's going to want to work with you. Right. So recap, biggest challenge conscious entrepreneurs face is time, you know, priorities. Uh, is this in alignment with your goals? Immediate business needs, significant business enhancement. Nice to have. If you're overcommitted, start delegating tasks to other people with better time skill to do that task. Saying no, four-step process, thank them for their request, be affirmative in your no, not wishy-washy, give the reason why, and try to help them in some other way without taking on this whole burden or responsibility yourself. Every morning, journal, exercise, meditate, and the bonus is reading, the most important leadership quality is integrity and being complete, and then know all the levels of integrity. This is to take your leadership to the next level. Do what you know to do. Do what you said you were going to do. Do it completely expected, meant to be done, and on time. And you're not going to always be perfect. You're going to be perfectly imperfect. And so what you can do is always work to be better tomorrow by apologizing and putting systems in place to make sure that you uh, take it done. <laughs> uh, thanks for the, the shout out and the clapping, Jeanette. I just want to highlight, I do some other trainings here with Shiftco. Uh, on page three or four is high performance communication for conscious entrepreneurs. This is to learn what are the big five traits uh, of psychology says about different communications. And then we go into DISC, what Fortune 500 companies use to help uh, manage different people and learning those different styles, how to flex them and how to be more successful communicating with those different styles. And then this training was the biggest challenge conscious entrepreneurs face. But again, I definitely want you to complete that exercise. Uh, and this is a transformational exercise. So put it in your calendar. As soon as you finish watching this recording, schedule about 30 minutes, uh, maybe about 15 minutes, but again, buffer it for 30 minutes uh, to do this exercise. And then the last training, which I recently just did for Shiftco, and I want to give you this confession. I think it's the most important training. Why? I actually have been managing people, you know, for almost two decades, and I've had bad managers, I had great managers, and managing all those people is how to actually delegate tasks to people. And here's what happens is sometimes people fail you, they will fail, but how to manage and coach them in such a way so that they actually perform at their peak performance. So that's definitely in step module two, so that they either shape up and perform at a higher level or they shape out. They're going to self-select themselves out and they're going to want to leave because they're going to say, wow, such a good manager you are. You hold me accountable to such high standards that I can't take it, right? And that's still a win-win. So thank you all so much. If you really enjoyed this, here's my contact information. You can reach out to me at any time. Uh, uh, here's my phone number, my email. And if you really love this training, please write down this assessment link, uh, bit.ly 3HMM LPN. And uh, if you fill out a survey, 
uh, I will actually give you a free gift. It's a handout, a leadership handout on uh, what are the formulas for success in leadership. So uh, just a fun little thing that you might enjoy. So I'll take any questions that you might have. I really appreciate the time. Oh, you're on mute, Terry. That was, that was amazing. And I wanted to, um, to share something with folks that's a new enhancement. So in the core, there's now something that says our teachers, and you can go down right to Tim's profile and all of his courses as they get launched are right here. So you, that's an easy way to get to them. And as he adds more courses, they'll, they'll be right here. So I just wanted to show that because that's a new feature that we have for our master teachers. Um, Tim, that was absolutely amazing. I took notes. I've got a couple of to-dos there. Really, really, really appreciate you being a master teacher and being a leader in our community. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.